It's actually Bond, James Bond. <laughs> hey, Bond. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, yeah, happy 2023 to everybody. Um, yeah, it's just with everything going on, um, you know, my uh, my views are pretty complicated, but I wanted to hear what you were thinking, Simon, after yesterday's uh, ruling, uh, specifically about Celsius. It seems uh, it's pretty, um, should we say, a, a very important precedent potentially that can uh, trickle down to all the uh, aforementioned uh, <laughs> um, fiascos we had last year. Yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, to cover the news, it's um, that uh, Judge Glenn, in the Celsius case, as many of you may be aware or may not be aware, um, ruled that due to the terms and conditions um, that our coins are property of Celsius, um, that was fought for by both Celsius uh, originally through Kirkland and Ellis and the Unsecured Creditors Committee through White and Case, um, and massively objected to by uh, many different in the earn groups and the loan groups, um, and uh, it was um, it, it was you know it was related to the custody group because those that held their funds in custody um, were obviously fighting for their coins to be theirs. Um, and therefore, by default, um, the other coins in urn will be uh, property of the estate. Um, I think we all knew it was coming. And what do I think about it? So firstly, uh, it boils my blood. Uh, it makes me infuriated because this is one of the most important issues that I've spent my lifetime work on around the ownership of money. At the same time, it was the right thing to do, unfortunately, um, at the current state. Um, so the UCC, the lawyers told us why it was the right thing to do. Um, and that is because um, it would have given claim to, uh, you know, it would have meant that uh, some of the shareholders would have uh, taken uh, some of the other assets and we would only have um, rights over the coins. Um, and also it meant that, for example, Alex Mijinsky, um lost a bunch of our Bitcoin um, when he went and goes shopping for a mining operation and used it as collateral and took out a loan and uh, decided to um, spend our money um, to try and generate yield. Um, then, you know, uh, it, it, for example, we had we would have had like a 70 or 80 percent haircut. And then those that own sell token or something where they had them funds in Treasury wouldn't have got a haircut. So it would have created that mess and a, and a big ginormous um, legal case. Uh, so it was the right thing to do for creditors, but a really, really bitter um, pill to swallow. What does it mean for the industry? Um, I think this is the playbook that we're going to see in all the cases. We've already seen it in BlockFi. Uh, BlockFi are immediately went out to try and give everyone with um, BlockFi wallets their coins back, um, saying the coins in the wallet is yours and therefore everything else is ours. Um, and Kirkland and Ellis will play the same playbook. Um, it'll probably be a bit faster. So get used to it. Um, anyone that said in their terms and conditions illegally that the funds are theirs, um, it's probably going to be made theirs. They, Judge Glenn didn't give a shit about the fact that it was completely illegal. They didn't have the licenses. All of the regulators objected, saying they don't have the licenses to do this. Um, but Judge Glenn hopefully was looking out for our interests because he, he knew that that was, was going to be the right result for creditors. Right. What does it mean in the long, long term future? Um, well, firstly, I don't think we'll be in this scenario again. I don't think that another illegal bank or illegal securities business can um, relaunch like this. Um, I don't think the regulators will allow one to launch. Um, and so we won't be in a position where somebody launches a company and gets up to you know, 20 billion or 30 billion in deposits. Um, and then finds out that regulators are sending cease and desist orders um, uh, to them. And, you know, so um, I don't think it's it means much in the future. Um, I think it just means that in the future, any businesses that launch under this model will have to have a banking license or will have to sell them as securities in compliance um, with the existing laws. Uh, and there'll be, you know, a lot more enforcement on the existing rules and regulations. Um, that's where I think it goes. Okay, let's bring on uh, David Bailey, CEO of Bitcoin Magazine. Hey, hey David. Hey, guys. Uh, 
First off, Simon, I want to say thank you for the shout out to the uh, Redeem GBTC campaign. We've had tons of inbound from it, and uh, I, people are calling you in the comments Saint Simon, which I, I gotta say I, I like the ring of. So um, <laughs> thank you for the thank you for the shout out. Uh, so joining your spaces, what caught my eye here is the, the Silvergate uh, element to this, and I do think that this is one of the most underreported stories going on right now. And I, and I think it's a very important story. And so uh, the comment I wanted to share on this was really more just a word of advice to the people in this room. Um, you know, Silvergate is a great company. It's a, it's a great business. It, in my opinion, the management seems um, very solid uh, and that some of the issues they're facing um, are, are not their fault of their own. They're, they're kind of subject of circumstance to a certain degree. Um, but that being said, uh, FDIC insurance only covers two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. And, you know, for every person here who works at a crypto company, if you're in the finance team of that crypto company, um, my advice would be to draw down your bank account to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and not leave any more uh, funds than that there at, at Silvergate. Um, and that that uh, probably applies as well to some of the other smaller banks in our industry, Customers Bank, um, I think there's another bank, uh, Zion Bank, or uh, and uh, Signature Bank is much larger, but I think also has the same risks. So just be smart with your bank accounts and make sure that you're leveraging that, that FDIC insurance limit. Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, David, as well. Yeah, it is very underreported, actually, the whole. Um, and I did actually forget to say, yeah, the individual $250,000 limit really important uh, to say that um briefly give us give us a, a quick um update on the whole uh, gbtc shareholder thing so uh, to give a bit of background um david bailey's uh, a bitcoin og uh, from bitcoin magazine we i think we didn't last time we met was in china i think when you were doing bitcoin adoption in china well, how the world has changed um and uh you know he's uh he's creating an initiative so if anyone is a gbtc um shareholder just give us a really brief overview and um uh, why they should go over to the redeem gbtc.com yeah i mean i'll, I'll give a, a, a optimistic um uh update i'll keep it brief uh, uh we're going to be doing a spaces this evening to kind of give people updates on share counts and uh updates on some of the developments this week but um there is a lot of momentum. I mean, the, the pressure cooker building in GBTC is unbelievable. Um, we crossed 1,200 shareholders today that have reached out. Yesterday, we had 300 shareholders alone that, that inbounded in through the website. The coalition represents institutional investors in TradFi, institutional investors in crypto, retail investors in their 401k, high net worth individuals, family offices. Um, the amount of shares that we've accumulated at this point stands somewhere between 15 and 20%. Um, uh, we don't wow. have any formal group in, in place yet. Um, uh, we are evaluating all of our, all of our options and we are, uh, diligently working on securing, uh, the best in class, um, securities, uh, class action attorneys. Um, and we are going to be fighting for every shareholder to, to maximize, um, uh, shareholder value and, and to, represent the perspective of shareholders uh, as whatever happens at DCG plays out. And it is a very complicated situation with a lot of moving parts, um, but we really don't have any other choice. So um, we have tons of momentum. We are about 19 days into the campaign so far, and we've gotten 1,200 shareholders. My next kind of milestone we're shooting for uh, is 8,500 shareholders, which there's 850,000 shareholders out there. So 8,500 is the 1% mark. Um, and, and we're blasting our way there. So, um, you know, we're not going to give up, even if the, the DCC, DCG situation gets worked out, which unfortunately I don't think it will be. But even if it, if it does, uh, we're not going to be satisfied until the discount is eliminated. So um, we're pushing that forward however we can. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, David. We'll take a, an, another question. Um, I, I unfortunately, because I'm not vaccinated, I can't make it over to the I'm, I'm holding strong um, and America won't let me in for the Bitcoin conference, unfortunately. So I haven't been able to attend that one. Hey, um, I, I will. Uh, I will let you know a little secret there. 
All you have to do is tell them that you're vaccinated. You don't actually have to be vaccinated. They don't check it at the at the um, when you land in the country. They don't they don't check it. They only check it uh, uh, when you check in with your flight. And I think most airlines have abandoned doing that. So um, just word for the wise, we'd love to see you in Miami. Uh, you're you're dearly missed. So um, awesome. All right, that's it. Thanks, David. <laughs> all right, who's next? Okay, let's bring up uh, Marco V. Hey, can yeah. I can I just say while we get to that question, how fucking awesome is it that YouTube and Twitter um, are leading to these types of you know bottom up movements uh, that are actually having a material impact in some of the biggest issues in our industry? I just think it's fucking awesome. Anyway, yeah. Hey, Simon, thanks for fighting the good fight. Um, question on Celsius chapter 11. Uh, I think mid October you had sent out a tweet about uh, um, accredited investors with net worth over a million to register on banks of the future about potentially putting together a bid coming together. Did I miss uh, any action on that? Is that still going on or what, what's the next steps there? Um, yeah. So I pivoted after FTX. I didn't think it was appropriate to raise finance. Um, in the current markets. Um, so at Bank to the Future, you know, for the last year, we really just buckled down on regulations um, and, and didn't put new pitches live apart from to some of our very exclusive investors. Um, and we were going to do that. Uh, we decided that we didn't think it was appropriate to uh, raise finance and go through a growth phase. You know, we're, we're, we're very comfortable as a business. Um, and, uh, you know, taking on 650,000 uh, customers is something you probably do in a growth phase. But once we hit FTX, we realized we well truly are in a pretty unique and special situation. Um, so we pivoted and um, I can't obviously discuss the intricate details. Um, and but we discussed around how we focused on using the bidding process in order to ensure that everybody gets their coins back in custody and any assets are used in order to issue equity uh, to creditors. Um, and uh, obviously just so much has changed in, throughout our chapter 11 process. So we will continue to engage throughout the bidding process, uh, continue to work with the UCC um, and continue to do whatever we can do in order to uh, make that goal useful. Um, but I'm sure as soon as we can, we'll publish exactly uh, what we what we did in the bidding process and try and meet the bankruptcy code uh, to do that. But we're not going to be raising finance um, at this stage. Uh, we got a lot of people that wanted to do that. And so we'll, we'll look for, I know people wanted to get like the lower valuations in these markets. Um, but also we didn't want to release an earned program. We wanted, I released a video on the future of yield. And I think that everything needs to flush its way out that there's been lots of fake yield in the market and i'm not comfortable with any provider that is using um people's coins as collateral to make investments um in the current market so uh the also um the salt deal um we cancelled um you know we're, we're just not comfortable with the way the market operates at the moment uh so that uh, all of that led to the perfect storm of pivoting from raising finance in order to bid for the assets to give everybody to just simply using the different processes to try and get everyone their assets back. So we're, we're still highly engaged, um, but the, the strategy and approach had to pivot slightly. Okay, let's bring up uh, Bradley. Hey, Simon, thanks for uh, letting me up. I have two questions for you. And hey, Bradley. To you I always love it when Bradley time. comes up, very confirmed. calming, very calming voice. <laughs> um, my first question is hopefully quick. I'm, I'm just curious. I'm assuming that uh, with Alex's recent um, legal woes that the, the case being brought against him by the New York AG, that he is paying for his own legal defense and that's not coming out of Celsius funds. Is that correct assumption? Uh, well, I don't know the answer to that. My assumption is that um, he would be paying for his own legal fees. Um, hopefully he dumped enough sell token on people to have enough Bitcoin um, in order to try and pay some of his fees. Um, but also I um, uh, want to make sure that the New York uh, doesn't confiscate all of the Bitcoin 
uh, for New Yorkers because I think that needs to be spread equally across creditors. So uh, it was it was you know in it was good to see, uh, but also Alex's wealth and the insider's wealth is a very valuable asset of the estate, um, and it's one of the most valuable assets of the estate. So I want to make I want us to all make sure that that is used for the benefit of creditors and not just a few in New York. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a question for the UCC, um, but it's worth pushing back on that um, and trying to get transparency on that. Okay. The second question I have is, um, has, have any of the events of you know the past few months changed your opinion on the likelihood of um, the judge in the UCC accepting a reorg plan? I think um, I think there's a high probability that a reorg just looks like a distribution. I think everything looks the same now. Um, so whereas, you know, th there are several choices. So I was upset about GKA because I would have preferred those shares to be issued to creditors. Um, once that was um, announced, you know, we pivoted our strategy. We put in, um, you know, and I understand these. Is a more speculative strategy than the the certainty that some people may have wanted. Um, so I'm not blaming anything there. Um, I think a UCC takeover um, could just look like using the same providers that could have been in the bidding process in order to distribute all the assets. Um, and I think that they could use um, Celsius to distribute all the assets if regulators allow them to do that. Um, there's litigation trust, which is the same, um, you know, all my interactions with the UCC, they watched all of the seven part video series. Um, and there are just three slightly different versions of it, um, which could either be done through a Celsius strategy, um, a bidding strategy, um, or a UCC takeover strategy. And I think they all just kind of look the same. It's just a question of what is the path of least resistance? Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the, the challenges in the market has fended off a lot of the predatory bids that might have been out there. I can't talk about the, bid, the bidding process, um, but we've seen like in Voyager that uh, the challenges that Binance has bid, it went from SBF, obviously phony money we know now, um, paying a 72% recovery to approximately a 50% recovery. Uh, with Binance and only bidding from 50 million to 20 million. Um, and uh, also the pushback that that's getting with regulators and political reasons. Um, you know, all of these factors that we said are coming into play. I said that regulations would be the biggest challenge. Um, and so if it, it's really a question of which model is the regulator going to sign off on and what's the fastest path to achieving the distributions. Uh, my, my opinions hasn't changed in, in that sense, but the circumstances um, and the likelihood of someone making a predatory bid, um, I think has changed just because there's so much distress in the market. Okay, uh, thanks for those questions. Um, let's bring on John Q. Hey, happy new year to you, Simon, and everybody listening. I think the last uh, question kind of was hitting on what my question was. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to Alex Mashinsky. Uh, now I know who the real Grinch is. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, hope your Christmas tree was full of gifts. Mine wasn't this year for the first time since I was a kid. Uh, so I wasn't able to afford Christmas gifts this year, Alex. So thanks a lot. Um, but uh, uh, Simon. I want to ask, and, and I think, again, the question might have just been asked. Um, my question was very simple. If the if they deny the reorg plan, just blatantly deny it, or regulatory approval is not possible, or whatever happens, a criminal case is brought up, or it's through the Ponzi, since Celsius owns our coins, uh, A, what would happen to those? And on the flip side, what do you think your estimate is or predictions about what would happen if a plan in a reorg uh, was approved? And I think maybe you had touched on that on the last question. Yeah, so um, uh, firstly, I'll, I'll shout out back to Alex Mijinsky in his own, own words. Fuck you, Alex. Um, and uh, thank you for ruining many people's Christmases. Hope you enjoyed yours. 
Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully you didn't dump too much sell tokens on your victims um, after the pause as well, that you can actually afford some legal fees um, because you're going to need them. <clears throat> um, the, the second thing is that... Um, Sorry, what was what was it? Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> Alex, it's no okay. Way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I just kind of a. I was wondering what would happen if if the reorg plan got just blatantly refused, and and yeah. or there wasn't regular regulatory path forward. What happens to uh, okay, I good. guess Celsius's coins at this yeah. point, yeah. and if it got approved, what is the likely path? Um, so yeah, something like that. If you could just give an yeah. estimate, thank you. Okay. So, um, firstly, uh, Celsius has got approval to sell the stable coins. Um, so they already can crunch through that. Uh, I think they can also take the GK8 fund. So they sold off GK8 um, and they said how much additional runway that gives them in order to try and get through their plan. Um, and, uh, I, you know, our sole mission has to be that um, they, they don't end up having to touch any of the Bitcoin or the ETH or anything like that. Um, surely at this stage, it's sell, so to, sell token. Um, they, should, they should be trying to get um, 50, you know, the, the volume, whatever's left in the sell token, they should be trying to uh, do that if they want to sell anything. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just really how fast can we get and what is the path of least resistance? Um, I, I anticipate lots of objections and uh, from regulators, um, but there are, you know, there's different partners, there's different companies, there's people that can take over the loans, there's people that can take over the mining, and there's people that can do the, the there's companies that are sufficiently regulated to do the distributions, um, there's companies that can issue shares, uh, you know, if, if Celsius does it, the UCC does it, or the uh, different bunch of bidders do it uh you know that's kind of up to the ucc to maximize the result um all my conversations with the ucc have been that they're uh you know they said that they're not looking to sell off the assets in distress so my biggest fear um is uh you know they 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 kind of confirmed that that's not something they're looking to do so i think we are in the hands of the ucc in order to try and find the fastest path with the least objections um, in order to try and distribute those assets and distribute those coins and distribute any equity. Okay, thanks for the question there, uh, John. Next um, speaker is Paint Tahoe. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Simon, for holding these uh, talks and I really appreciate all the information you provide. I had a question about the relationship between a bank like Silvergate and an exchange like Kraken. Mm -hmm. uh, are they holding the cash deposits? Is the bank holding the cash deposits for the exchange? I know they're doing the ACH and wire transfers, but are they actually holding the 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 US USD that's that's that shows up on Kraken? Um exactly, yeah. So full disclosure I an early shareholder in Kraken um, still hold those shares. Um, my assumption here is that they, they've got a range of banks. Um, I don't know the exact answer, but I know Silvergate is one of them. Um, and Silvergate essentially built a way for an exchange to manage their deposits and withdrawals and provide traditional commercial banking um, with APIs. So when you go to uh, Kraken, depending on what jurisdiction is and which currency you're engaging with, um, then you will go that you want to deposit some dollars and it will give you um, likely their Silvergate bank details. Um, they're held in title with Kraken. So Kraken, not legal advice, um, would have the $250,000 FDIC limit. But you know that, uh, uh, you know, you know that that would uh, they'd have much, much greater deposits in an omnibus account. Um, those, when you log into your Kraken account and you see dollars, um, you know, that needs to be backed by all dollars that are likely held in Silvergate or other banks. Um, and that's why when we were doing Twitter spaces, uh, Jesse Powell came up and said, look, just withdraw your dollars, withdraw your coins, 
it's just a liability to us. You only want you to put the ones on there that you're going to be trading with. We don't want you to use us for storage. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is that you have a commercial agreement on top of a bank account that's provided to Kraken. It's not an individual bank account for each of the individual users. And so the FDIC would be one company. Um, and, uh, and yes, so that's where the dollars would be held. Um, I don't think that they would be custodying any of the crypto assets um, with Silvergate. Um, and again, although I'm a shareholder, I'm just speaking from my understanding what I think happened. Um, we need to get uh, someone from Kraken to actually fully confirm it. Okay, thanks for that question. Next uh, speaker is, I think it's, yeah, Ryan. Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Ryan. So um, my question is for Simon. Would you agree with the statement that Celsius Network operated as a Ponzi scheme, essentially? Um, that Obviously, with everything that's come out, there wasn't any type of actual revenue to support the yields they were paying out. Yeah, I've um I've never actually called um Celsius a Ponzi scheme. But it is one. Um we... but um I'd love to see the full disclosed financial history and the examiner report. The examiner did say um in the courts that um that she wouldn't call it a Ponzi scheme. She said, I'll present they're being very kind to us as creditors. Um I think they know that there's consequences to it being a Ponzi and not being a Ponzi. And at the time, pre-FTX, um, they were probably thinking that there was lots of value for, for, for creditors in the mining operation and all that type of stuff. Um, and so it would be detrimental to the estate calling it a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, but, um, but, if but it, wouldn't there be additional yeah. uh, tax benefits, though? Uh, my understanding, not a tax advisor, and um, I don't live in the U.S., so I don't have any experience with the IRS, but... Um, uh, my understanding is that the Madoff case had very large tax benefits as a result of being classified um, a Ponzi. Um, so what, what the examiner did say is that they will release the report and nobody wants to make the determination. Um, so they're leaving it up to the judges and then Celsius and UCC could probably argue it. Um, and just like when they ignored um, the fact that Celsius was an illegal bank and a legal securities business, um, they ignored that because they wanted to do what they thought was right by creditors, despite the 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 the, the slash and the and the back the backlash they got from people like me and uh, others in the in the program. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'll I'll leave that to um, the information being presented from the examiner report, which is seventeenth of January, um, and uh, you know I don't want to start using that word until there is a reason to use that word and I haven't quite uh, figured everything out yet. I'd like to see more events come through um, then. Um, but I, I do agree with you that um, if there was no profits and yield was being paid uh, from new deposits and relying upon people not withdrawing, um, then that sure as hell meets the definition of a word that begins with P. Thanks for the question. Um, next speaker is AA. Hey, Sam, big fan. Uh, with regard to DCG, what do you think happens to GBTC and Ethereum Trust and all those other trusts they have under management? Thanks. Um, okay, so let me put some speculative hat on. I, I don't think GBTC recovers from here, is my opinion. Um, people are talking about how, uh, you know, Obviously, it's it's a great stream of revenue because uh, Digital Currency Group gets two percent on that, which has been you know chugging off two hundred million a year, which is one of their most valuable assets that makes their way up to the parent company, presuming, uh, which would be one of the sources that I think um, Barry will be uh, negotiating right now. The challenge is, is that if it's not recovering from a fifty percent discount. Um, then you need to start looking at some of the initiatives that David Bailey was talking about, like reducing the fees from 2% to half a percent to make it more competitive with overseas 
non-US ETFs, or you'd need to look at um, a takeover um, that would allow for some kind of redemption through a new structure that would require SEC approval. Um, but my personal opinion is that uh, GBTC does not come back from here as a vastly inferior product that served a very good purpose at the time when there was no alternative. But because the SEC has not been approving US dollar ETFs, um, there's amazing ETFs that you need a bit of currency risk in Canada and Australian dollars and even in Britain, the GBPs. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it comes back from here. On the bullish side, uh, maybe we get um, a US dollar ETF out of this. That's a bit of hopium. Um, but if you can um, hold strong, there's a nightmare in figuring out how to redeem. But, you know, that's what the David Bailey and his team are shooting for. And if they can get enough shareholder support, um, then it can be shifted from acting in the best interest of digital currency groups shareholders to acting in the best interest of GBTC's um, shareholders. But unfortunately, that's going to have a knock on impact on digital currency groups. So I understand that's not going to come voluntarily. It's going to have to come up from a bottom up movement, which is why I wanted to support David Bailey and um, his initiative so we can try and support those shareholders. That's my crystal balling. I think it's going to take a while though. Okay, let's bring on um, Hilux. Hi, Simon. Uh, in the last Celsius UCC AMA, it was mentioned one of the avenues going forward has them in discussion with various unnamed platforms to house the assets going forward. What would happen if this avenue pans out and the platform chosen is not Celsius or Bank to the Future? Uh, it, it's something that is forbidden in my jurisdiction. Uh, such as in, I'm from Ontario, Canada, we are forbidden from using Binance, Bittrex, Gate, Wobi, KuCoin. But what would happen if one of those was the sort of winning bidder? Uh, what would likely happen, I guess? Uh, interesting. I don't think I even know the answer to that. Like, so, would they just give us a check or something? Well, that is one of the options. Um, you know, the one of the options. So what? Let, let's try and work through an example. It's a great question. Um, so in the Voyager case, uh, FTX, cool, it's so funny talking about FTX as a legitimate company, but um, FTX, uh, you know, said that uh, there were certain coins that they couldn't support because they might be defined as securities in the US um, and they uh, didn't have the licenses to offer those securities. Uh, so they were going to dollarize those, um, those coins and send checks. There was also... Um, there was an option for people that didn't want to use FTX. And so, for example, if Celsius just became a liquidation distribution company, um, then you could have a US trustee in charge or oversight or the existing team um, that has some kind of court oversight in its, in its um, execution. Um, but for example, I don't imagine everyone that has $100, let's say Binance won the bid, I don't imagine everyone that had like a hundred dollars and there's like 300,000 customers that have a hundred dollars on their account needing to transfer over to Binance just to receive those coins back. Um, I think you could get court approval for Celsius just to execute those transactions, but then put forward an offer whereby if they did it through Binance, uh, and this is what happened in the FTX scenario, they said, anyone that signs up to FTX gets a $50 in their account, but you don't have to sign up. But then those that um, leave them there, maybe there'll be some lobbying effort to allow Celsius to try and uh, distribute those funds, or at the worst case scenario, <laughs> you, you receive checks in the post, which uh, hopefully isn't the scenario that, that comes through. Jesus, there's so much better ways of doing things. Okay, thank you. It's an, it's an interesting thought exercise. Um, I don't know the answer, but there's a few things to think about. Thanks. We'll see. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Java Newby. Hi, Simon. Thank you. So I was having thoughts about the um, potential retail callbacks. Do you have any comments on that regarding yesterday's, what happened yesterday? Um, yeah, so... The, the UCC in their town hall 
um, I kind of stepped down everybody. I didn't want to upset the lemons and cats. So um, I decided not to ask any questions and watch a recording later. Um, don't want to create, a, you know, and it was great just to see real questions being answered by, you know, people that really are just thinking about the best um, for creditors. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they stated that Celsius isn't looking to pursue clawbacks, that the UCC isn't looking to pursue um, clawbacks. They are interested in insider clawbacks. They are interested in Tether and other institutional clawbacks. Um, and, uh, you know, the only reason that they need to withhold funds is because um, Judge Glenn is demanding that they figure out the preference issue probably based upon all his years of experience of seeing these things happened in the past. Um, <clears throat> so I think clawbacks become an issue if we enter into complete distress with no company going forward. If there is going to be a company moving forward in whatever shape or form it is, then I think the, the clawback issue is less likely to present itself. And even if it does, um, there are very valid defenses and, uh, you know, Plan C is putting together groups right now um, to try and plan uh, those types of defenses. I know it's been a big issue um, there. So there are groups getting ready for those defenses. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it just all depends on, on how nasty it gets and, and, and how much worse the market gets and if there's no business going forward. Um, is, is really preferable to, you know, get it through where funds are being distributed through somebody that bids and opts out of doing clawbacks. But if not, uh, you know, then just making sure that there is a some kind of interest going forward in continuing those relationships. So it's still an, it's still an unknown. Um, and I know it's causing a lot of anxiety for people. But I think the call yesterday was really trying to present that it's an issue we have to look at because of the judge, but it's a non-issue uh, from their from their side. I don't know what to believe anymore. Okay, next speaker is Nati. Nati, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. All right. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Nati. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, to two question to continue. Uh, do we have a precedent on the Voyager Chapter Eleven on insider clawbacks on C suit executive? Uh, yeah. They. Um, I, I. I remember the. They tried to maintain, but they didn't think the value of the CEO's wealth was much because apparently. Uh, this is one of the things that Plan C has been trying to get ahead of. Um, apparently, in the Voyager case, a bunch they they people were speculating. I don't know what's true uh, that a bunch of his personal wealth went into a trust structure, and mm -hmm. they put together a bunch of sheltering of um, wealth. I know that even funds on Celsius show that um, Alex Mazinski and others have been putting uh, do have such structures. Um, right. So, yeah, I think this is going to become a thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, let's it's... see. I think if you have a Celsius account mm -hmm. and you have a Celsius account for your trust, there's probably something interesting there in, in making, uh, making sure that the relationship is seen. So, for example, let's say Alex Majinski created a Celsius account for his trust. And then he was the controller of that trust and executed the withdrawal through his IP address. Uh, then he would have stolen the money from the trust because, in theory, the trustee uh, would have been the only person that could have executed that. This is all just speculation. I'm not a lawyer, um, but it may need. I'm sure he's going to fight it right through to discovery. Um, we'll see. All interesting questions. Hadn't really thought about it. All right. A second question is, um, you feel quite optimistic uh, right now. Uh, I'm wrong with that. Uh, how do you feel about the Celsius Chapter 11 uh, uh, finality? Uh, I'm hoping for Q2 uh, this year, June uh, liquidation. And uh, I, I feel you are quite optimistic right now, maybe due, due to the civil lawsuit. Mm, what do you have to say about uh, how you feel? Um... Thank you. I go through a range of motions, probably as you do. Um, I'm a bit up and down. Um, I'm in, in my head, mentally, 
Um, I think everyone has a good shot at receiving 50% of their funds back. Um, and anything else on top of that is is bonus and gravy. And I think if you can come to terms with that you've lost 50% of your funds and you're probably not going to see them for, say, another uh, six to seven to eight months, so you, if you can come to terms with that you may see 50% of your money this year, um, then I think plan plan for that. Uh, and, um, you know, there's going to be a longer journey. We're, we're definitely on a longer journey together after that. And so it was great to see the UCC talking about things I haven't heard them say before, like liquidating and litigation trusts. Um, that's a derivative of the fund structure um, that I talked about, which was get out of Chapter 11 and then put all the assets and the litigation into a structure and then pursue those with some kind of fund manager. And my guess is that the professionals of the UCC would love to get the gig um, for that. Uh, so, you know, th these are all kind of just derivatives of, of the original approach uh, and they can just be executed in different ways. So I wouldn't say I'm optimistic. I just come to terms with 50% being a likely outcome this year. And everything else on top of that would be a bonus. And I'll keep fighting for whatever we can achieve on top of that. Um, and I think the UCC um, will continue to try and fight for that as well. Um, I do think the the whole um, Alex, you know, knowing that, because um, it is one of the most valuable assets is um, Alex's wealth and unjust enrichment. Um, and I don't understand anyone that uh, would not be looking at that as a very valuable asset to the estate, then they, they must be conflicted in various other ways. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes remaining and one speaker here. So if anyone else wants to ask a question to Simon, Simon please um, step forward. Is, is there like a big queue? I'm happy to go a bit longer. No, no, no. It's just, we just got one more speaker. Okay, That's, cool. Uh, right. Skaminski. Skaminski. Yeah, the parody account. See. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? Uh, Skaminski, you want to say hello or do you want to remain silent? Probably mic issues. Oh man, I thought we were going to hear the live Skaminski. Oh, Skaminski, it's gone. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to bring up a point? or um, ask a question. We've got no one. We've exhausted the one hour mark. Uh, happy to go through anything else. Otherwise, we'll just uh, wrap it up here. This is going to be the first one oh, where we haven't had we Celsius lanes. Tony Vitticelli, here we go. Hey, Tony. It's connecting. Um, AA's got another question. Tony, can you hear us? Yes, I'm in. Can you guys hear me? Hey, Tony, you come for comedy or for que or for question? Uh, no, I came to give an applause. Uh, I'm actually running into a meeting, but I joined this space uh, a little while ago. The first thing I heard was Simon say, <laughs> fuck you, Alex Mashinsky. And I just want to <laughs> applaud it. I think we finally broke you down, Simon. Um, the reality is, I don't think we... Uh, have much say in this whole process. A lot of people get worked up. A lot of people get emotional. They get really angry. <clears throat> you can't really change your emotions day to day, week to week, month to month. You know, most uh, bankruptcies from everyone I've spoken to, a year to get the whole thing done is considered super fast, right? That's considered like the fast track. Uh, most bankruptcies take forever. <clears throat> it's a huge drain financially, emotionally, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's just a really, really difficult process. So a lot of people tend to get very emotional. Um, it is what it is. Like, we're going to lose our money, not all of it. You're going to lose, like, 50% or whatever. If we can get more than that, that's fantastic. But, you know, everyone's trying to go against each other. Let's claw back this guy. Let's do soft clawbacks. Let's do hard clawbacks. There really is no point in all these arguments because it's not going to change anything. Uh, it's not going to make a difference. Soft clawbacks doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not a real thing. You know, we're, we're talking about 
possibilities that might happen, might not happen, whatever it is. Reality is, you know, we were all we all put ourselves in a bad situation by listening to Alex. Yeah, Alex messed up. Yeah, he did a whole bunch of shit that he shouldn't have done. But, you know, we just got to move on. You know, we, we, we were given the gift of being able to buy Bitcoin at 2017 prices. Um, just do your best. You made the money once. You can make it again. Don't get too emotional. Just work your way back to where you were. And by the next bull, bull cycle, you're not going to care because this thing is going to go through the roof. So what does it matter? Just, you know, stay even keel and everything will work itself out. That's all I wanted to say. I just want to applaud Simon. Finally, finally, you said what you wanted to say. You stopped trying to be too, uh, uh, I don't want to say British. 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 Well, no, if you were British, you would have said what you really wanted to say. <laughs> too deluded. You're trying to be too political, politically correct or whatever. Fuck Alex. Fuck all these guys. But, you know. This process will get resolved eventually. It is what it is. We all just need to stay even keel and just stack sacks, stack sacks until the next, uh, uh, stack sats, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm under the weather. I can barely talk. But, you know, until the next bull cycle, and then we're not even going to care about Celsius after that. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much for those um, comments, Tone. And I do credit you and Ronan uh, for actually bringing out the personality and the joker in me because it actually feels a lot better um, when you get into one of those crazy threads talking about Seltoshi and uh, cell token. That was actually a turning point for me. So I want to credit you guys for uh, bringing out the humor because this was a very serious process that exhausted a lot of hours, a lot of financial resources, a lot of emotional resources. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, you know, we built some in incredible uh, friendships here uh, and, and Twitter spaces has been just absolutely wild in terms of the impact that it's having um, on people. And there was an article today about uh, how, you know, the I think it was in, well, I forgot what, which publication it is, but I think it was the Wall Street Journal just saying how these Twitter spaces were ahead of all the information curve and um, it lead to you know, the direct um, actions that were taken against SBF. Um, and I know, I for one know that I've seen lots of language that we've used in these Twitter spaces uh, filed in many regulators' court dockets and objections and various other things. So, yeah. Uh, and I do think we got quite a bit of time to um, rebuild and accumulate because, as I said, we, we still got some, some, some big problems in our industry. Uh, but still as confident that Bitcoin is going to come back. Bigger, better, badder, stronger. Not financial advice. Uh, but been here before. This one was pretty rough, though. Hey, Azad, do you want to end there? Or was there like a couple more people that came up? Um, let's just take on two more questions. We've got another question from AA. And then we'll have uh, Bit Shuffler. And that, then we'll wrap it up. Hey, Simon. Sorry again. Uh, quick question going back to the GBTC point. Yeah. Um, what 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 is your view it happens to shareholders? I'll, I'll be forthcoming. I own a lot of GBTC Ethereum trust as well. Not sure how this whole debacle impacts me outside of just the price being, you know, a press, price pressure on the share price. But just curious what your thoughts are. Thanks. Yeah, I think you've got a battle ahead of you. But join um, David Bailey's um, group, redeemedgbtc.com. He's trying to get, um, you know, a big chunk of shareholders together and momentum's really building. Um, and they're looking to represent the interest of um, GBTC shareholders. Um, in terms of where it goes, uh, if I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it's a long-term play for you. Um, and so you don't need to sell in distress. Yeah, yeah great. Um, then I'm hoping that there's going to be over the long term uh, some kind of mechanism that allows for redemption um, or one of the initiatives of lowering the fees significantly leads to a different, you know, a, a more normal pricing. Um, I'm not sure the pricing is coming back. I mean, maybe it comes back up to like between 50 and 30% discount. Um, I, I'm not sure it's coming back. It all depends on what happens with the recovery. Um, but I, I'm not, I, I think there's a big hole in, in DCG uh, and 
whether Barry can fill it or not, we're going to find out over the next couple of weeks, and that will impact the price of GBTC. Uh, but I think we'll get. I think there will be a redemption mechanism, um, and hopefully we can use it on a bit of hopium to to get an ETF out of it and some kind of conversion mechanism, or maybe a takeover that leads to a redemption mechanism as well. Um, yeah, I, I I think I think there's there there is hope at the end of that. You just got to be patient on that one, and hopefully you're not in a position where you have to sell in distress. Okay, final question from Bit Shuffler. Hi, uh, thanks for answering these questions. Um, with the Celsius estate, I was just wondering, uh, does it is there any possibility that it owes a large amount of tax itself, and then it would, you know, it would need to pay out to whatever government it owes the tax to, or is it in a in the case of it's got losses and therefore it wouldn't need to pay tax. So I was just kind of wondering about the recovery in that respect. Yeah, um, everyone ignores the whole tax part, but it's such a huge part of it. Um, so once the plan is understood and known, um, there is a huge, and the fact that now Celsius owns the coins, um, it means, for example, we were suggesting converting everything into Bitcoin and ETH. And rather than converting the stable coins into paying Celsius's staff and runway for a reorg, using it in order to accumulate more Bitcoin and ETH um, at, at, in these markets and execute some OTC trades. And if Celsius executes that trade, um, then it may have different tax implications. Uh, but from my perspective and from my research, uh, there were tax issues at Celsius. Celsius did not do everything correctly. And one of the sections on the examiner report is um, tax. And so obviously they're using that for the IRS to figure out whether they're a creditor or not. Um, or if we're going to be um, less skeptical, maybe that they know that there's some kind of relief that would be useful in this process. But at some stage, the tax thing needs to be faced head on. And I think one, you know, the three parts of the examiner report are the tax side, the sell token manipulation uh, and the misrepresentation of the product. So hopefully we'll get more clarity there and we can talk about it. And uh, we, we did actually at one stage, we wanted to, um, Azad was working to bring together a panel of tax people and we actually managed, we can't say it, but we actually managed to get the team that was working um, on the, the tax investigation. Um, and uh, we know who those people are. And so they were trying to get permission from their firm, but they were fearful of being sued. So at some stage, and also, um, uh, Dan from Recap, he was a he was a creditor, and uh, he's on the crypto tax side and stuff. But when when the moment's right, we'll try and put together some people that actually can answer these questions. Um, yeah, there's definitely something there. Well, Dan's on this um, Twitter space with us actually, and he's reached out. Uh, oh, cool. Know that there are some contacts he has. We yeah, should, we could be able to. Yeah, so if Dan's on okay. here and you want to come up, just raise your hand. If not. That's fine. Let's see if I can bring up Dan one second. Well, I think raise your hand if you want to come up. Fair enough. <laughs> you want to bring him up? Yeah. He's not going to raise his hand. It's fine. Oh, he can't hear, no? Uh, wait, let me just try and bring him up one second. Okay, cool. While you're doing um, that, do you want to just well, have someone else? We've, yeah, we'll just put up uh, Rug Pool USA. Rugpool. You there, Rugpool? Can, We've been can rugged. you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Rug. How you doing? Thanks for taking my question. I believe Silvergate is currently designated as well capitalized as by regulators. Do you know if that is in jeopardy? How soon that change can occur and how that might affect its funding? Yeah, well, the the massive exodus in withdrawals can happen over a you know, public companies and regulators. They work in, you know, uh, with a bank. You'd expect some kind of daily reconciliation, um, or weekly reconciliation, depending on the size of the bank and the statistical importance of the bank. Or it even could have real time reporting into um, its regulator, whether that's the OCC or the Fed or whatever it is. 
depending on what type of bank it is. Um, so I don't know that particular, what is that particular status? Where do you get that from? I thought I saw it in their most recent 10Q. I believe it stated that they're designated as well capitalized. And did it did it give any kind of indication on how up to date that is or how real time that is? Um, I I want to say that's as of September, I believe. September. Yep, September. Yeah, years. so much has changed since then. So you could, I don't think you could rely on a September rating uh, for the current situation. I mean, so many exchanges have had massive withdrawals since then. Uh, we've also had you know, a, a turn in the real estate market since then. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that factors in there an accurate representation of where they are right now. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, Dan's um, probably okay. not there. He's not available, but next time. All right, cool. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed the first Twitter space of 2023. Uh, we've got a lot. <laughs> um, I'm sure next week we'll be discussing some other craziness. Um, every week it's like that. We have our weekly team meetings in, in house and I keep thinking it couldn't get more crazy this week. Um, but lo and behold, it does. Uh, so I think 2023 is a, a wild ride. Take um, Tony's words, you know, Tony's words there. The, there are parts of this process that we just simply can't control. Um, and it's not worth stressing ourselves about. Again, I'm working towards 50% at some point this year and everything else being a, a bonus on top. Um, but we'll be in this journey together. I'll end as the way I always do. Always remember you're alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history. Many are going to get hurt. Others are going to do really well. And all we can do is stay together as a community.